Welcome to Discovering. National Geographic described him as the father of nature photography, and much of his work was done right here in the Upper Peninsula. To find out more, we'll talk with NMU professor and author James McCommons, who wrote the book on George Shiras. Stick around, it's Monday night and time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover. When you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan The name George Shiras is recognizable to some on a local, national, and even global level. In the Marquette area, you may have visited Shiras Park, or the Shiras Room at the Peter White Library, maybe even passed by his resting place. But to many, the name is unfamiliar. So who was George Shiras? Why did National Geographic describe him as the father of wildlife photography? And what is his connection to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan? To shed some light, I met with NMU professor James McCommons at the Peter White Camp near Marquette. So George Shiras was known as the father of wildlife photography. He was the originator of the Migratory Bird Act. He first introduced a bill in Congress in 1906 called the Shiras Bird Bill. He also was the person who discovered moose in Yellowstone National Park in the early 1900s. In 1906, George Shiras III, a lawyer and amateur naturalist from Pittsburgh, published a series of remarkable nighttime photographs in National Geographic, a small and struggling scientific journal not yet known for its photography. Taken with crude equipment and often using trip wires, the black and white photographs featured leaping white-tailed deer, a beaver gnawing on a tree, and a snowy owl perched along the shore of Whitefish Lake in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. The pictures, stunning in detail and composition, celebrated American wildlife at a time when many species, especially birds, were in decline and going extinct because of habitat loss and unrestrained hunting. At the beginning of the 20th century, wildlife photography gave conservationists a powerful new tool to draw attention to environmental destruction and rally lawmakers to pass protections and create preserves. So how did George Cyrus III manage to get these stunning photos of wildlife when the equipment to do so did not yet exist? How and why did this Pennsylvania lawyer end up here in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan? These questions were enough to inspire author James McCommons to write a book about this creatively unique and influential pioneer. I'm originally from Pennsylvania and um, I've lived in the UP twice. First time I worked as a journalist at the Escanaba Daily Press when I was just out of, um, just out of college. And uh, I met my wife in Escanaba, and then we moved away for about 20 years. And then I got um, a position at Northern Teaching Journalism as a professor. And I had been teaching part-time uh, out east where I, where I was working. But when I got to Marquette, I started to see all of these things that were named after Shiras. There was the Shiras Room at the library. There was Shiras Hills. There was Shiras Park. I um, learned that he had been a photographer, had been a wildlife photographer, had done his work. But over the course of several years, I, and I was teaching a class in nature writing, that I realized George Shiras was really quite an important national figure of the early 20th century. 
as a conservationist during the progressive period. And then I decided that I would start doing more research. And eventually what happened was we found three boxes of material that um, were in a warehouse that, that um, had been there for 40 years. And we found an unfinished autobiography that George had started. We found um, original letters between George Shiras and Theodore Roosevelt, other conservationists of the period. Um, we found some scrapbooks that George had uh, put together. So over the course of the next eight years, I've been doing research, uh, Library of Congress, uh, traveling different parts of the country, um, going to archives, picking up letters about George Shiras. And that's how the book came about. It came about as an academic project, and I got funding through Northern Michigan University um, to do some of the research. And so finally, after all this time, it's come to fruition. George Shiras first came to the UP in 1848 to fish. He was a fly fisherman. He was a businessman in Pittsburgh. He liked the area around Marquette. He met some people who were starting to sort of hack a town out of the wilderness there, and one of the people he met was Peter White. As Marquette was being built, turning from the town of Worcester to the town of Marquette, he started to bring back his son. George III first started to come to Marquette in 1871, when he was uh, a boy. They would come out to hunt with uh, Jack Lapete. Jack Lapete was a French Indian guide out of Marquette who worked for Peter White. And Jack Lapete brought them out here when they were young men to hunt deer. The very first time uh, George Shiras came out, he was 10, uh, 10 years old. He walked out with Jack Lapete. It took them two days. They overnighted, uh, camped on the Sand River on Lake Superior, and then walked into here. So in 1881, George, Jake, Peter White, and the Eli boys built their own hunting camp on Laughing Whitefish River, just a few hundred yards north of the lake. There they could easily put in a canoe and descend through the marshy wetlands into the open lake. The new camp was primitive, just hip walls of logs, crowned by a peaked roof of birch bark weighed down with half logs. They were rough-hewn bunks and tables indoors and benches and logs for sitting outside. Cooking was done over a grate and open fire. They stored pots and pans on a hollow log. Once after making coffee, which everyone said had been excellent but had a unique taste, they discovered a dead toad in the pot. For years after, the joke around camp was, do you want coffee a la mode or coffee a la toad? The Shirases had settled on the Upper Peninsula partly because of their great love of the outdoors. And they were always friends with Peter White as well. Young George noticed Fanny White, uh, Peter's daughter, and the two of them got married in their 20s. And so the Shiras families and the White families came together in that way. So when they first started to come out here to hunt, of course, there, there weren't game laws. There was a lot of market hunting of deer. As laws started to come about and hunting season started to be established, George could not come here and hunt any time he wanted to. It would only be during deer season. By this time, he was an attorney in Pittsburgh, and his, um, the time he could spend in the Upper Peninsula was quite limited, uh, only for a couple of weeks. Yet he would st still see deer in some of his favorite places around Whitefish Lake and uh, wanted to hunt them. And he realized that he no longer could do that with a gun, and that's when he decided to pick up a camera. He often said that it was just as interesting to shoot a deer with a camera versus a rifle. And, um, and he began to call himself a camera hunter. So he had a new hobby, it was photography. So he brought a landscape camera up here in the 1880s. And this was a camera where there was no shutter. You simply set it up, remove the lens cap to expose the glass plate. The plate was quite slow, as you would uh, call it at that time, in, in that it needed a lot of light or a lot of duration of time to expose the plate properly. George 
decided he would try to get a picture of a deer, which he said that um, he should have picked a different animal that didn't move so much. It took him almost three years to get his first picture of a deer using this camera. He needed a better camera. And at that time, when he was back in Pittsburgh, he met some people who had bought a Schmid detective camera. And it was called a detective camera because you could take pictures in lower light. Well, he brought a Schmid detective camera back to um, Whitefish Lake. And um, he got a pretty good picture of a deer, but it was quite far away. So he remembered those nights of going fire hunting when they used to go out and shoot deer at night. So he brought his camera to camp one night and said, we're going to go out t at night. And at that time, the way you illuminated people in a picture or objects would be with flash powder. So George fashioned his first flash from a pie plate and a wick, took it out on the lake and tried to take a picture of a deer. They had a kerosene lantern with a parabolic mirror that they could shine on the deer. And that would freeze the deer on the shoreline. They would push their canoe towards the deer, which was again frozen in the light. George would stand up in the canoe and then try to fire off this flashlight. Well, the difficulty he had was that the shutter would not open at the same time that the flash went off, that the flash powder went off. And so this was a big problem um, because the flash would go off and then the camera would open, but it would be dark again. So he had to come up with a new apparatus. He invented what he called the flashlight pistol, which was a 22 gun that he fashioned with a blank cartridge so that when he pulled the trigger on the gun, it would um, fire and ignite flash powder. It was much more precise than the other thing that he was using, and eventually he was able to do a pretty good synchronization between the flash and the powder, but he did a lot of experimentation, and it took another couple years before he got his first night picture. <laughs> Later, he came up with the idea of making a camera trap. And this was setting the camera up at night, putting a trip wire in, and putting it on a game trail or someplace where the animal would trip the wire, set off the camera shutter mechanism at the same time that the flash would go off. There was a lot of difficulty in getting that to work correctly. In the early 1900s, he took on a new assistant, and this was a man named John Hammer. John Hammer had been a mechanic and had worked in an optical works in Sweden. And John Hammer had the idea of using a kind of air pump mechanism that when the trip wire went off, it would fire this pump that would then um, set off both the flash and the camera at the same time. And eventually, um, Hammer took out a patent on that. So we do know that Shiras worked with many of these devices himself in the beginning, and then later when John Hammer came along, that Hammer's mechanical abilities was critical to the operation. The two men worked together for the next 20 to 30 years as, um, as a team. I have patents that I have found from both Shiras and from Hammer. George set up these cameras with his, um, with his flashes and, um, and trip wires and created what he called the camera trap. And the camera trap really is the first trail camera. So George Shiras is the inventor of the trail camera. He is the first person who ever took pictures of wildlife using an automatic device like this. One night, George and Hammer pushed the boat into the lake and witnessed a spectacular display of the Aurora Borealis, which Shiras claimed was as bright as the full moon. Simultaneously, a cloud moved overhead, flickering with lightning, 
heat lightning, apparently, for there were no thunderclaps, no possibility of rain. The night being warm and quiet and momentarily so bright that taking pictures would be impossible, the men floated about, mesmerized, until the dark return. That night, Cyrus came across a fine-looking buck with a set of uh, developing antlers. Quote, Although intent on getting the picture, I was at the same time impressed with the beauty of the scene. Between the canoe and the animal were hundreds of little white flowers, and in a circle of light stood the big stag, quartering and looking away. The black background obscured the distant alders and made more distinct and impressive this monarch of the forest. He captured other images that year. A mother with twin fawns, a white tail slinking head down as it hears the howl of a nearby wolf, a doe drinking along the shoreline with its image reflected in the water. Other critters revealed themselves when he developed the plates back in the laboratory, a porcupine walking on a log just a few feet from the white tail. These black and white photographs, high in contrast and awash in deep blacks, were not mere snapshots but elegant images of animal and nature. They were art. So the, the first pictures were taken using just one flash. Um, what George found was that the deer were often looking down uh, because they were pawing on the ground where he put a little bit of salt or uh, some sort of bait to make them trip the wire. So he came up with this idea of using two uh, flashes. And so the deer would basically paw um, tripped the first wire and one flash would go off, which, which of course the noise and the explosion would frighten the deer. They would leap and then a second flash would go off in synchronization that would get them in action. So he took several of these pictures that um, showed leaping deer and some of these are his most iconic images. The camp was built in the 1880s, and the first way to get into camp was to walk uh, all the way from Marquette. Eventually, the railroad came through, and Deerton was established um, six miles north of here, so they could take a um, train out from Marquette, get off in Deerton, and they would walk into the camp. And it would take a good hour to walk into the camp. Supplies were brought in from, from Deerton uh, by a farmer that, that they had contracted with. But a lot of the supplies were, the food supplies were here. Uh, they hunt, hunted deer, uh, so they had venison. This whole front area of the camp is where they had their camp gardens. They also made maple sugar from the, from the woods. It was the Upper Peninsula, and especially the camp at Whitefish Lake, that served as his touchstone, the place where he formed his love for wildlife and expressed his passion for photography and wild country. By 1921, George Shiras had summered in the Upper Peninsula for more than 50 years. The rusty camp at Whitefish Lake, where he and the guides once stored their coffee pot and cookware in a hollow log, had morphed into a 10-room cabin. Shiras built a separate cabin for John Hammer, who assumed caretaker duties over the camp and the hundreds of acres of surrounding land where the family timbered commercially, tapped up to a thousand trees to produce maple sugar for sale. The old walking trail from the railroad had turned into the Peter White Road, and George and his extended family reached the camp from Marquette by automobile in less than an hour. George Shiras III certainly made his mark in history, and he did a lot of it right here in the Upper Peninsula. Some might say he was lucky to have found the Upper Peninsula. I kind of like to think the Upper Peninsula maybe found him, found him and brought him here, to a place that inspired him to become a photographer, a place that inspired him to be creative and inventive. That happens a lot here. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 fishing report, TV6 weather, shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering 906.